Uh, so let me start. Uh, Dambash, greetings everyone. My name is uh, Sardar Saadi and I'm the director of the Institute of Social Sciences at the University of Rojava. Our colleagues at the University of uh, Kobani invited me to moderate this lecture. And on behalf of both the University of Kobani and the University of Rojava, I'm very pleased to welcome you all, uh, especially Professor Zizek to this online lecture by uh, Zizek titled, Is Democracy Still an Option? This is the inaugural lecture by the University of Kobani and indeed a historical event to host Slavo Zizek for a university that was established in recent years in 2017 in a city that symbolize, uh, symbolizes uh, resistance and revolution against all odds. And uh, again, thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation, Professor Zizek, and for your uh, talk today. I would let uh, Suzanne Kasim, the vice co-president of the University of Kobani to talk about the university. But before that, I would like to give uh, a couple of uh, uh, online housekeeping announcements. Uh, the, the lecture is currently live on the University of Kobani's YouTube channel. And uh, unfortunately, the link that we created, for some reasons, it didn't work again. Uh, so uh, I can post the new YouTube link in the uh, in the chat box and our friends uh, from the University of Kobani, if you can find it and post it on Facebook and everywhere else, that would be great. Uh, we have allocated about 15 minutes uh, for the question and answer session uh, after Professor Zizek's lecture. And please write your questions in the Q, uh, question and answer box in the webinar room or in the comment section on YouTube. If you are in the webinar room, uh, there is a simultaneous interpretation option available from uh, English to Kurdish Kermanji and vice versa. Please check the interpretation section for uh, the two channels. It should be at the bottom. Uh, Mr. Jalil Kaya is our interpreter today. Uh, the interpretation uh, option is not, unfortunately, again, available for the live broadcast on YouTube. So without further ado, uh, please join me to welcome the vice co-president of the University of Kobani, Mamosta Suzan Qasim, to present her uh, welcoming remarks. Can I make a Good evening, everyone. Uh, Good evening. On behalf of the co-presidents, staff, students, and community members, at the University of Kobani, let me welcome you all to today's historical lecture. I'd like to extend my special welcome to Professor Zizek and thank you for accepting to give today's lecture. Just a few years ago, our homeland the small and remote city in the far north of Syria became a symbol of resistance and courage. And it is well known all over the world. The men of Israel, one of the most vicious military groups on the face of Earth, was destroyed here in Kuwait in 2015. Avali Mustafa, thank you. Thank you, Kutbu. So this is one of the problems that we are dealing with, unfortunately, uh, no electricity and the uh, online uh, connection uh, has always been a uh, big trouble for us. Uh, um, I'm so sorry, Professor Zizek, can I- No just... problem, <laughs> I'm used to it, no problem. Okay, uh, uh, Mamosta, uh, uh, Suzanne, uh, we, Madenge ve baş ne biz, tutikari ki sadi tubar erkeği. Dube. Tamam, let's, yani bizler hafdu da tutikari bu khuini. Yani le bende havale celil mebe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. 
on behalf of the co-presidents, staff, community members, University of Kumani, let me welcome you all to today's historical lecture. I'd like to extend my special welcome to Professor Zizek. Just a few years ago, our homeland Kumani, the small and remote city and farms of Syria became a symbol of resistance and courage. And it is now well known all over the world. Many people have been on the face of earth was destroyed here in Kumani in 2015. It was a fierce war. Our heroes, Yapaki and Yabaja, fought a brave fight and they are still fighting against ISIS, jihadist groups, and the Turkish occupation forces. After this historic victory, there was a massive difference to rebuild their city by them. the severe lack of stuff and the proper infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, but we did not stop. We did not surrender. In 2017, the University of Kobani was established. The start was humble, and our teaching staff, to some extent, had not the required academic level. Year after year, our university made a relative progress, and we do our best to make it equal to university around the world as much as we can. And today, we are pleased to host a world-renewed intellectual, a Slovi Zizek. We hope this is the beginning of an ongoing collaboration and cooperation with academic intellectuals and universities all around the world. Kobani is a symbol of resistance, and we want also to make it a symbol of revolutionary rebuilding. We call on everyone to support us with their experiences. I hope you all have a wonderful time with the Professor Slobaj Zizek lecture. There's much to learn from him. Thank you very much. George Spurs, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mamosta Suzan. Uh, I would like to ask uh, all the panelists if you can uh, mute yourself, uh, that would be great. Uh, okay, so uh, unfortunately this is one of the issues that we have uh, when working with the uh, universities in Rojava that uh, unfortunately connection is never stable and uh, electricity is also an issue. Uh, I apologize to you all and uh, Professor Zizek so let me now uh, introduce uh, Dr. Engin Sustam, who will introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Engin Sustam is an associate researcher at the uh, CITOPAC as part of the uh, EHESS uh, Paris, a visiting associate professor at the University of Paris 8, University of Genova and ENS. He specializes in political sociology, art, aesthetic and philosophy with the current focus on uh, bottom-up articulations of global revolt, Kurdish areas, social movement, democracy, power, contemporary art, uh, the <coughs> colonial perspective, and social ecology. He published two books, Art and Kurdish Subalternity uh, Between Violence and Resistance, uh, and then uh, a new one, New, from, uh, new Form of Global uh, Insurrections. Uh, Dr. Sustan, please. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. And uh, thank, thank, thank you very much, Sarda, to give me the floor. Um, I don't want to prolong my speech. If you allow me, dear Zizek, I just want to give you some information on your bios, and then I will give the floor to you. Um, firstly, I would like to to, to thank the University of Kobani for this seminar and organization. And thank you so much for accepting this, Zizek, this great event. 
This is an important initiative to talk with Zizek in this crazy time with this concept, democracy and ideology. And of course, this organization is very effective also for the University of Kobane, which is trying to survive under the military conflict in the Middle East. So who is Slavoj, Slavoj Zizek? So Slavoj Zizek is Slovenian philosopher and cultural theorist whose works address his stance in political left philosophy psychoanalysis, film analysis, and popular culture. He's uh, one of the most prominent public intellectual today. In 1970s, his entries shifted from the, from the social theory of the Frankfurt School, which provided him with a psychoanalytic and Marxist critic of ideology. In 19, 1989, his best now with his first book, The Sublime Object of Ideology, and for his work of Jacques Lacan from the perspective of popular culture, of course. Besides Hegel and Lacan, uh, Zizek often quotes from leftist philosophers such as Jacques Rancière, Etienne Bolivar, Gilles Deleuze, and of course, Alain Badiou, and has formulated a criticism of Carl Schmitt. He has written on various subjects such as fundamentalism, tolerance, political correctness, globalization, postmodernism, multiculturalism, Marxism, and anti capitalism. And finally, on personalities like Lenin, David Lynch, or Alfred Hitchcock. His studies, psychoanalysis at the University of Paris 8, receiving a second PhD for an unorthodox Lacanian interpretation of Egal Marx and so Kripke, from the early 1990s, he's invited as a visiting professor at the numerous, numerous universities in Europe and the United States. It can be said, no Marxist philosopher, philosopher, Zizek is a rising figure of the alternative left today, close to the philosopher Alain Badiou, with whom he defends the idea of communism as a practical emergency. I remember your conference with Badio on the imminence of truth and Hegel in Paris, of course. Zizek has published over 40 books, as everybody knows that. I would like just now to remind the latest books, which are quite important of our time, to discuss the new global capitalism under the pandemic and the control society application of power. The new books are Pandemic 1, COVID-19 Shakes the Ball, and Pandemic 2, Chronicle of a Time Lost. Zizek analyzed in these books this pandemic time like a panic reflex. He underlines the need for a pragmatist communism. As last first, the global resistance needs a very new form of democracy and ecological practice, I don't know, against this authoritarian capitalism. That's a maybe new form of communism. Could you maybe talk about it during your articulation? I just want to add that, like you know, the autonomous administration of Rojava tried to transform some reading of ideology and apply a new form, direct democracy. Maybe your presentation could analyze also these experiences as a mobilizing utopia in the Middle East, in the world. So the floor is yours, dear Zizek. Thank you very much to welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here with you. And I will try, usually I make this mistake, not to talk too fast. And I will keep to 35 minutes as I was ordered, maybe a minute or two more. And when I say I like to be with you and so on and so on, these are not the usual empty phrases, how people begin talks politely. I mean it very seriously. Why? Because as gentlemen who introduced me already pointed out, the fate of the Kurds makes them the exemplary victim of today's geopolitical games. Spread along the borderline of four neighboring states, 
Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran. Their full autonomy is in nobody's interest. But the true miracle resides somewhere else, in the ability of the Kurds to organize their communal life. This ability was tested in an almost experimental way. The moment you Kurds were given a space to breathe freely, a little bit freely, outside the conflicts of the states around you, you surprised the world. You quickly built a society that one cannot but designate as an actually existing utopia with thriving intellectual uh, community. So you are more than a symbol of resistance. You are a symbol of how not only to resist, but then to install, experiment with, build a new order. This is what is needed today. We get again and again the same boring picture. Remember, in Istanbul, in uh, uh, Athens, in, in Madrid, blah, blah, you, we get big demonstrations, one million people uh, cry, shout together, and then, and then the enthusiasm is lost and more or less nothing remains. You remember what happened in Egypt? Almost one million people in Cairo on the main square, then you got your freedom, free elections, and you get Muslim Brotherhood. And you, you are glad that the, uh, almost that the army makes coup d'etat. What you try to do is, it's not me giving you a historical talk. I am addressing you as one of the few examples in the world how you have You've demonstrated, proven that, this is my formula, that, uh, that uh, a new order can be built. People want this new order. Let me give you a simple example. We all watched it probably on the screens. You remember the inauguration of... Uh, new president Joe Biden. This was, I think, for me, a pretty disgusting ideological event. All happy together, we got rid of Donald Trump, things will return to normality. But then, you know who was the star of the event? A lone old man sitting there, and everybody talked about him. Bernie Sanders, of course. The fact that millions talked about him, I don't want to talk about Sanders, but about the importance of the fact that he attracted all the attentions. Millions uh, downloaded those images and so on, meant that it's not just a couple of us crazy radical leftists, but millions of ordinary people felt that, that there was something wrong in that big spectacle of inauguration, the old order is back. No, that a new order is needed. Just with his presence, presence there, sitting alone as if he wanted to say, sorry guys, I'm not part of that show. He give, gave body to an alternative. People want. People want this. And you, Kurds, you belong to this line. So uh, this brings me to my topic. What's the fate in all of this of democracy? What kind of democratization can help not only Kurds, but all of us? It's certainly not just the expansion of the standard Western multi-party democracy. A tension which is imminent to the very idea of parliamentary democracy is gaining visibility today. 
Democracy means two things. The power of the people in the sense that the substantial will of the majority should express itself and the trust in electoral mechanism. Democracy means, yes, there may be manipulations and so on, but once the votes are counted, all sides accept the, the result. Of course, we leftists and even some rightists claim this parliamentary mechanism is not neutral. And this is true. Uh, because not, I, this is the crazy thing today. It's no longer that less developed countries, so-called third world countries, are the countries where democracy doesn't function and then we look to the West. No, the standard democracy, multi-party representative democracy, is in crisis in the so-called developed West itself. If you follow a little bit the news, you may have noticed some very strange phenomena. Like in 2005, 17 years ago, I was in United Kingdom and the Labour Party with Tony Blair won the election. But two weeks before the election, there was a big opinion poll who is the most hated person in the United Kingdom. The same person, Tony Blair. And this is a very tragic phenomenon which should worry us. We have a certain dissatisfaction, protest, which somehow escapes the regular voting mechanism of multi-party democracy. You have a dissatisfaction which cannot be expressed through the regular parliamentary democratic uh, channels. There is another example of this. Do you remember in France, I think it was some three years ago or when, uh, these protests of so-called yellow West, vests. It's not protests of people who are deprived of democracy. It's a much more mysterious protest. It is, it's a protest of people who are dissatisfied precisely by parliamentary democracy with all its freedoms and so on and so on. And uh, what was so tragic was that, okay, then Macron, president, the government, tried to play a polite role. He said, okay, come to me, we will debate and it was a terrible experience. They talked different languages in some sense. They, it became clear that we have here a gap that what people who were protesting demanded simply in some sense couldn't be translated into the usual language of parliamentary, uh, parliamentary manipulations and so on and so on. It was, if you remember it, the same in Spain, some 10 even more, I think, years ago, it was the same popular explosion with uh, Podemos, the movement. Hundreds of thousands of people on the streets and so on. And then, what happened then? Then, finally, Podemos constituted itself as a party, and now it's part of a government. It's just an ordinary, let's call it social democratic political party. No big difference from socialists. Where did that energy, uh, where did that energy go? What is the problem here? The crisis of liberal democracy lasts for decades. The COVID epidemic only made it explode beyond a certain level. The basic premise of a functioning democracy is today more and more undermined. Namely, the trust on which democracy relies. 
this trust was best expressed by Abraham Lincoln's famous saying, you can fool all the people some of the time, and some of the people you can fool all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. But I think the latest experiences tell us that things are even a little bit darker, like you can fool most of the people most of the time, definitely. It's in very rare moments that collectively people can live in truth. And I will return to this later. Another thing you must abandon here is the two simple paranoiac theory that there are evil manipulators who manipulate, who make the people blind. No, manipulators who fool the people are always themselves fool. For example, in the United States, you shouldn't think that Donald Trump knew exactly what it was going on and lied to the people. No, he was also definitely lying to himself. So here comes my, uh, <coughs> sorry, my pessimist, if you want, pessimistic uh, uh, insight. What really did strike me is that leftists advocate all the time some kind of immediate, direct democracy where the people is given, pe people are given voice directly. But what shocked me is that I remember from Donald Trump's inauguration speech in 2017, how he used the same term. Let me remind you, I quote Donald Trump. Today's ceremony has a very special meaning because today we are not only transferring power from one, one administration to another, from one party to another, but we are transferring power from Washington, D.C., and we are giving it back to you, the people. Uh, till now, elites were ruling, but this all changes now, starting right here and now, because this moment is your moment. It belongs to you. It belongs to everyone gathered here today and everyone watching all across America. This is your day. So isn't a paradox that Donald Trump in his populism uses the terminology, which is usually the terminology of the radical leftist critics. And let me go even to the end here. We all watched uh, uh, in the beginning of January of this year how the mob, the crowd of Trump protesters, invaded, broke into the Capitol. And what made me sad is the, the reaction of my leftist friend who said, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing happening. People directly breaking into the seat of power, trying to take over. Just it's that they are not the right people. We should be doing this, not they. I don't, uh, I don't accept this. I think that with the, a few big courageous exceptions like you Kurds, maybe some others up to a point in Bolivia and so on. Today, these people, the people into whom democracy tells us to trust, these people is more and more divided, no longer exists. Now I will do, uh, I think, uh, something strange. It may sound totalitarian, but it's meant radic in a radically democratic way. I think that we are all so caught in our divisions. The whole world is today in some kind of a ideological civil war 
that uh, the people, the task of a revolution is not only to represent adequately people, but in the same way to make people, if you want to construct the people, to make people aware of what, aware, sorry, of what they want. People don't simply know, I want this. And then you go into politics like on a market, oh, this politician is telling what, me what I want, that other is telling even better, I will vote for him and so on and so on. No, people need leaders or at least a leading organization. Uh, because I will now do something very strange. I will quote, you know, the old car maker from United States who invented serially produced car making, Henry Ford. He said that uh, he didn't follow what people wanted. He said that if he were to ask people, what do you want? People would have answered, I want a better and stronger horse to pull our carriage. And he didn't give them a better, stronger horse. He gave them cars. And something like this is happening today. We shouldn't just ask for a better horse, for better functioning of what is here. We should ask for something that was more than 100 years ago, like a horse. We should want, we should demand or try to invent through leaders a better help. And to avoid a misunderstanding, a leader for me is not the one who tells you what you want, who gives you orders and so on. Uh, uh, a true, you know, don't mystify the people. They are confused today. They are all caught in ideology, in their egotist problems, dreams. Ideology is, we can talk about more about this later. I just want to tell you now that ideology is not some abstract system of values and so on. Ideology is inscribed into your everyday experiences. Like for me, the best example of ideology is everyday racism. It's usually not even put in ideological terms. When you walk in the street and see a foreigner from some so-called third world country and you are disturbed by him or her, you tell, say yourself, okay, I am not a racist, but I don't want to be too close to him and so on and so on. That's everyday life ideology. How we eat, how we marry, how we make love and so on. All this is ideology. And the message of a good leader is not, no, I know better than you what you want, but it's, I give you hope. It's like Bernie Sanders just sitting there. I give you hope you can move beyond this, out of this. And another thing for what I think a good leader is needed is to make tough decisions. Because as much as I like this emphatic moment of popular unity, half a million of people demonstrating and so on, I more and more think that the system can and was always able, the system of power, to accommodate with these outbursts. You wait a little bit in the shadows, then the enthusiasm fades away and you things return to the old order. No, uh, the problem is to translate this popular discontent into a new form of political organization. You have to make tough decisions in this sense, only in this sense, because this is a very dangerous metaphor. In this sense, politi uh, politics is like uh, medicine, healthcare. You have to make tough decisions or military command. You have to say, sorry, now we have to, to risk that thousands will die in that unit. Or we cannot take care of all the patients, 
some will die, who will die, and so on. These are horrible decisions. The best definition of leader, because I am an ordinary low guy, I also watch ordinary TV series, I warn you. I watch that American uh, medical doctor series, New Amsterdam, where uh, an administrator says, said, tells an old doctor, leaders make choices that keep them awake at night. If you sleep well, you are not one of them. You are not a leader. This is, for me, a good uh, leader. So it's not simply direct people's democracy. You need inspirational figures. We need force to organize it because, again, it's not just political alienation and so on. It's also the other side, which is in crisis today. We no longer can simply say the people, which people, people are divided uh, and so on. What do I mean by this? For Marxists, people usually meant working class. But did you notice how, if you know a little bit of history, how in every epoch, a specific group of workers functioned as a symbol of they are the true proletarians. For example, 100 years ago in Europe, it was usually miners or steel workers who were like the real working class. Uh, who is this today? There are many candidates and we have to accept this plurality. There are, of course, workers, exploited workers, especially in the third world. Then there are in the third world, those who are not exploited in the usual sense, being hired, paid a wage, and the capitalist or the state keeps the profit. But they are exploited in the sense that the cycle of capitalist production ruins their conditions of existence. For example, I read in the north of Canada, they are now doing producing oil through that process, fracking and so on. And they are doing it, a lot of it in the land where only few, whatever you call them, Native Americans, uh, the first people live. They are not exploited directly. They even get some state support, but they're Condition because the land that is left after fracking is done is a destroyed land with uh, polluted with chemicals and so on and so on. So they are definitely also exploited. Then we have students with no chance of employment. We have precarious workers living in great uncertainty. We have uh, women who are doing work which is not caught in the capitalist process of valorization, they are doing unpaid work. And as intelligent analysis have shown, without this unpaid work of women and other uh, family members, the ordinary capitalist exploitation cannot work. You, we, all these other forms have to be here. If Today, that was the big lesson of my good friend, the ex-Bolivian uh, 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 vice president, Alvaro Garcia Linera, that uh, in these conditions, it's madness to focus on the old working class. In many countries, working class is a little bit privileged with regard to unemployed women and so on, they can, uh, they can do things that those truly exploited cannot even dream of doing. Like maybe this can interest you. In my country, Slovenia, I must admit, I often opposed workers' strikes. Why? Not because I'm, I don't agree with the idea of workers striking, but because I learned that in Slovenia, only those privileged workers, those in, with a firm job uh, employed by the state, doctors, policemen, judges, professors, they can afford to strike. 
ordinary workers in small companies cannot afford to strike. So paradoxically, being a classical proletarian with a stable job is almost already uh, a privilege today. And I think that this leftist dream that somehow we should all come together, we mean students, workers, immigrants, and so on, is very difficult to achieve. My friend Alain Badiou, whom you, Engin, I think already kindly mentioned, he is uh, even a pessimist here. I would not go as far as he does, but he even thinks that in Western Europe, in the United States, workers are already as a group, part of what Lenin called workers' aristocracy. Privilege totally corrupted, we cannot count on them. Then, but you propose us as an ersatz, another uh, emancipatory agent, uh, what he calls nomadic pro proletarians, those, the homeless people who emigrate to Europe and so on and so on. But even there, I think things are not so simple because I read a very good analysis who comes to Europe as an emigrant? Mostly, it's not the truly desperate from those countries, like, uh, I don't know, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and so on. Those who come are, okay, there are also children, women, but most of them are very able young people, even with some financial stability, because, you know, to come from Afghanistan to Europe, you need thousands of dollars to do the to bribe all the customers and so on and so on so uh, i think that and that's the sad strength of today's global capitalism it's almost impossible to build a united front against him what does this mean for democracy i will now quote from somebody with whom i absolutely don't agree but here he made a good point. The best chair author, Yuval Harari. He wrote that, I quote, people feel bound by democratic elections only when they share a basic bond with most other voters. If the experience of other voters is alien to me, and if I believe they don't understand my feelings and don't care about my vital interests, then even if I am outvoted by a hundred to one, I have absolutely no reason to accept the verdict." End of quote. So uh, this, I think, is happening today. I think this is maybe the root, one of the roots of the crisis of liberal democracy. Peter like to say a democracy implies differences and so on. Yes, but differences against the background of a basic pact. Like with you, the, the Kurds, you cannot say the solution is big democratic elections in all of Syria and Turkey. Yes, it would be nice, but I, I can well imagine, I don't know, this is pure hypothesis in Turkey, Erdogan, uh, mobilizing the crowd against you and presenting you as intruders and so on and so on. Again, elections work when a certain solidarity is already here. We may oppose each other, but we accept basic rules. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, what is happening with the crisis of democracy today. In the United States, we have now an almost, almost a war, an ideological civil war. We have half of the people, maybe a little bit more, who still remain liberal Democrats with all the limitations. And then we have almost half of the people, Trump followers, populists. And what is so interesting is that how this opposition, and they don't speak the same language, the, the country is falling apart, the crisis in the United States, you cannot resolve it 
by simple big democratic elections. You get, you get, you get two countries. The situation is totally mystified because Trump populists, manipulated by many billionaires, nonetheless act as representatives of the people, while uh, uh, Democrats who also want to represent minorities and so on and so on also often play a very a very strange game with ordinary people and so on and so on. But uh, what I want to emphasize is this. I think that liberal democracy, which presupposes something that I'm tempted to call a basic social pact. By this, I mean something very specific. As my favorite philosopher, Hegel, the German idealist, pointed out, what keeps a society together, really, and incidentally, if I will ever be lucky to visit your part of the world, this is what would have interested me. You know, people say there are rules. Yes, there are rules that keep every society together. But then not all rules are explicit. There are rules that are not explicitly stated. There are unwritten rules, customs, and so on. And that is today falling apart. This is, I think, the crisis of COVID that was triggered by the pandemic. You know? We had our everyday lives. You walk around, meet friends, socialize, and so on and so on. These everyday customs are threatened. And then authorities are, of course, uh, uh, giving orders, keep distance, and so on and so on. But we are somehow deprived of this substance of our lives, uh, ethical substance, the unwritten rules, not the explicit written rules. Because you know, again, it's not enough to know the rules. You have also to know which rules you are allowed secretly to disobey. For example, a comical example. When I was young, it was the official morality was don't have sex when you are not married, conservative. But then Everybody expected you to engage in sexual life. You know, you were considered very weird if you didn't broke the explicit rules. Or the opposite paradox, my favor. You are solicited, you are given a certain freedom on condition that you don't use that freedom. You know, this, so society is a very complex example. And I think that uh, Trump played a certain positive role in the sense that he ruined this ideological hegemony, the order of unwritten rules. And not only Trump did this in the United States, this is happening all around the world, in Germany, in England, and so on, and so on. But, uh, and so again, for example, United States, I don't see a solution. What should you do? People claim we should step all together. We are one nation. No, in some sense, they are not one nation. They have less and less of ideological uh, common ground. But here, I'm ready to go even a step further. We cannot simply say, yes, Trump is bad, so we should get rid of Trump. Joe Biden and liberal Democrats should win. No. We should never forget that Trump is what in psychiatry we call a symptom, a sign of something that was wrong in liberal democracy itself. Trump didn't fall uh, from the moon. Now, let me, so that I will not talk too long, just a couple of pages, let me make a step further here. And this is maybe the saddest thing of what is going on today. And I'm sure from what I've learned that in your part of the world, things are more civilized. In spite of all the horrible suffering that you have there, we Europeans and Americans are, I'm afraid, the true barbarians today. Namely, 
the ethical catastrophe of Trump and new right-wing populists is this uh, incredible degradation of public social life. You are able to make dirty jokes, to say obscenities. Decency is disappearing. And here, something very strange is happening today. I hope some of you know a wonderful book by Angela Negle, an Irish girl, girl, lady, living in the United States, Kill All Normies, where she describes how I remember when I was young, late 60s, 70s, those in power spoke the official language of dignity, bombastic, patriotic, while we leftist protesters, you know, we made sign like this, use dirty words, we consider this subversive. But did you notice that now, this new so-called alt-right, alternative right, especially in the United States, they use dirty language, sexual obscenities, incredible vulgarity, and so on. And this is a tragedy. The left is, at least the official liberal democratic left, is retreating to old, uh, not only moralism, but even police brutality. Now the left wants to censor public space and so on and so on. It's a total mess. So that then the new right appears more and more as a partisan of uh, a partisan of uh, of uh, 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 personal freedoms and the, uh, the sorry the new right is partisan of human freedoms. You can talk dirty and so on, whatever you want. And the left. The left as partisan of law and order. They want more police interventions uh, and so on and so on. Another element in this crisis, I'm approaching the end, don't be afraid, is this big motive that we find in uh, bombarded with by the media that we live in a post truth era. But here, I think things are a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more ambiguous. The idea is this one: with the rise of religious and ethnic fundamentalism, uh, rational argumentation no longer works, as we see also today with some reactions to the pandemic, the explosion of uh, conspiracy theories, and so on, uh, and so on. Then the idea is that also with the digital media, there is no longer one public space. It's a dispersion. Uh, and uh, also in theory, you, you get, uh, you get, uh, 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 sorry, in theory, you get so-called postmodern historicists who say there is no objective truth, we just have different subjective perspectives and so on and so on. Now, my position here is that, of course, this is true. Every approach to society is already in some sense interested, engaged. I don't believe in objective truth. But this does not mean that this does not mean that all truths are equal. I'm not a relativist. Let me give you an example which will please the Jews. Look, uh, it, when Nazis were saying, when they were taking power in Germany, that Jewish influence is too strong, and when they gave you some statistics like more than half of the doctors in Berlin are Jewish, 60% of the lawyers are Jewish, and so on. Probably they were telling something true. But nonetheless, this factual truth was in the service of the anti-Semitic lie. What I want to tell you this is to repeat an old joke of mine that I like when, uh, not even a joke, a clinical observation by Jacques Lacan, my teacher in psychoanalysis, who said, when a husband is pathologically jealous of his wife, 
that he sleeps together with other men. E- even if his wife really sleeps with other men, his jealousy is still pathological. Because the problem is not, does his wife really sleep with other men or not? The problem is, why does he need jealousy to maintain his psychic stability and order and so on, uh, and order and so on and so on? So, uh, <coughs> again, uh, and the same, the same goes for today's Israel. To talk about anti Semitism today in Israel, you must talk also about what Israel itself is doing, for example, to the Palestinians on the West Bank. I think that our answer to oppression of Palestinians should not be, yes, they are justified, let's tolerate a little bit of anti-Semitism. No, the struggle against anti-Semitism in Europe and so on, and the struggle for Palestinian rights are two sides of the same struggle. We should not we should, to the end, resist this uh, crazy logic that there is a basic truth, but then small entities should be sacrificed to this truth. I don't know if I already mentioned this, but here comes my, I think I skipped that over. Here comes my big sympathy with you, Kurtz. I remember, you remember when uh, uh, Americans abandoned you to the interplay of Erdogan, Turkey, and Russia, and Syria, and so on. Uh, Many of my friends agreed with Trump. It's good that he did that. And they even reproached you that uh, you were protected by Americans. And I told them, okay, it was a geopolitical mess. What should you have done? Should you have said, Yeah, I know Uh, America, the greatest imperialist power, uh, supports us, so we should sacrifice ourselves for the anti-imperialist world struggle and so on and so on. No, this is the basic lie that today in the politics embodied in you, not in you, in you as the sign place where this lie appears, as if, you know, a fundamental Truth means that everybody has to sacrifice himself, his identity to it. As even the guy who criticized me a lot, Noam Chomsky, if you remember, said, yes, I'm again American intervention, but there, when they protected you as long as did against Turkey and so on, Americans, I'm for them, was for them. Don't think in these mechanical terms. Politics are paradoxes, especially today in the new multicentric world, you know. For example, take Myanmar. Some of my friends said that they support the coup d'etat because those who were democratically elected were too close to the West and so on and so on. This logic is horrible and you were, you were its uh, victims. Uh, but the last point I want to make is that uh, You know, those who talk about relativization of truth and so on and so on, where I don't agree with them is when they say that uh, we are now in the era of death of truth, post-truth. Wait a minute. As if there was a time when we lived in the era of truth. Take the Cold War. Both sides were lying, maybe communist Soviet Union more, but both sides were totally lying. The point is just that each of the opposed sides, Western democracy, Soviet socialism, controlled its public space. Now this public space is exploding. And uh, our task today is, is what? Our task today is precisely not to dwell in this historicist relativism. You Kurds have your own vision. I don't know, Turks have their own vision. Uh, Others, uh, Afghanistan is their own vision, which should all coexist. No, 
I claim that is the paradox, the basic lesson of Marxism that you embody, that truth is not neutral in a country where there is oppression. You can formulate a truth about that country only from a position of those who are most radical fighters for freedom in that country. Truth is not an objective category. No, what you discover with an objective analysis is just how best to exploit people, <laughs> how to manipulate them, and so on, and so on. Truth is an, truth is an engaged, truth is an engaged category. So that's my first lesson. We have to build a new universalism. You, the Kurds, are my model, not because you are interesting small guys who somehow found your, uh, uh, reasserted your identity. No, you interest me because you are a miracle. Because, not your fault, but because of crazy uh, geopolitical games, you are like salami sliced into, you know, uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish part, Greek part, and so on, and so on. And you embody the lie. And nobody is allowed to dismiss you as, oh, that particular problem, let's not think about that. No, the, we will live in a freer world where what is happening to you could no longer could no longer happen. That's important. Uh, second thing, as for the uh, as for the truth and so on, what the case that I mentioned, how people accuse you of, but nonetheless you are supported by Americans, then you cannot be so good and so on. No, you know what's the problem? The problem is that ideology today is not problematic when it lies. But when it lies with elements of truth. For example, let's take even Trump. He was basically a populist lie. But some things he said were partially true. Like when he said how American big capital cooperates with China to outsource production, to exploit, uh, to, to, to keep the wages lower of American workers, and so on and so on. You know, ideology is, the, is most dangerous where, when it lies with the truth. And nobody has to force you to abandon your truth because of some higher ideological interest. Like, let us say that in some crazy future constellation, uh, Russia would take over totally Syria, make, made a pact with Erdogan against United States and Israel, I'm dreaming. And then people would say, that's a big anti-imperialist achievement, so you Kurds, you are off now. <laughs> For, no, never, never, this should never, never happen. The, the measure of truth in politics is that you have a global vision in which nobody is sacrificed in this sense. But really to conclude one page, I'm not lying, uh, sorry that I was so long, really to conclude, uh, so yes, democracy is still of some use, but it will have to be radically invented. You know what is typical thing today? Look, Ukraine or even Belarus and so on. Okay, you have a bad dictator. It's easy to mobilize people to fight against him and then uh, we want democracy. But then when you get democracy, you see that you have the same problems sometimes in an even worse form. For example, remember a great man, Nelson Mandela. They wanted end of apartheid and democracy. They got it, but now dissatisfaction of the black majority. There is even, according to some sources, more poverty, certainly more uh, corruption and violence than under apartheid. So, you know, democracy has to, yes, democracy has to be reinvented. The dialectic of political process is not just that you pursue a certain goal. You try to do something, then in the process, 
you discover that you have to redefine the goal itself. We have to rethink what we mean by democracy today. And here, I will not teach you. We should all learn from you. So to end with the old joke that I often use in my books, there is the legendary Hollywood producer, Sam Goldwyn. He was a relatively progressive, good guy, but he was well known for many of his nonsenses, but which were intelligent nonsenses. So once he got from his studio uh, a report that press is complaining that in the scenarios of his films, dialogues, there are too many old cliches used. So he wrote a memo to people who wrote scenarios for his film, telling them, we urgently need more new cliches. That's what we need today in politics. We don't need big original things. We need cliches. Cliches, by this I mean customs, manners, how to organize in these crazy times new mode of everyday life. That's the big problem for us in developed countries, maybe even more than with you. You know, with, we have a health problem with the pandemic. We have economic problem. But I fear, and it's becoming more and more clear, that the biggest problem will be mental health. Violence is exploding because these everyday rituals, customs of people are broken. We are in a terrible situation of Re literally building new cliches, new customs. We have to construct new everyday life. And here, I'm not bluffing, we will all learn from you. We, Europe and the United States, are ethically a catastrophe. We are lost today. So thank you very much. It was an honor for me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Zizek. Um, there was a lot to think about. There was a lot to process. Uh, but also some dark messages. You noted this. You know, that <laughs> I, I, don't, well, I don't like to provide easy solutions, you know. So we are in a very much a very difficult situation. To, so uh, I think people in Kobani and we are very much used to. Uh, but are you safe now? Sorry to interrupt because you should listen more to me. I mean, I gave a talk, but are you relatively safe now? Because at a certain point you disappeared from the big news. Are you now safe? Turks and Syrians leave you alone, or are you relatively peaceful? I, I, now? I don't live in Rojava, no, but uh, I, that, no. yes, I know that uh, uh, this relative safety right now, we can say that th there is a relative safety, but mm -hmm. it's very fragile. And uh, uh, the attacks, the, the threats by Erdogan, Erdogan has this saying that at uh, a dark moment at night, we might come. So he's leaving that to the moment that he, uh, he could attack Rojava, he could attack uh, Kurds and uh, um, like very much open. So this is a very fragile situation. And uh, I think uh, people in Rojava are trying to find their place in this, uh, all of this geopolitical uh, games. Uh, unfortunately, some of them, uh, we are creating the conditions, some are not uh, in our, uh, in their hands. So there are many questions, Professor Zizek. Some of them Let's are try, more, yeah. more theoretical and uh, we uh, have questions in different places. Some questions are coming from the room uh, uh, and some of them are, uh, uh, some of them are coming from, uh, uh, from Kobani. They are sending through uh, WhatsApp. I know, I saw them, yeah, the, the yes. lady who greeted me, yes. Yeah, and I'm glad to say that uh, more than 1,100 people are watching this uh, uh, live uh, broadcast on YouTube. Okay, so let me start with the first question that uh, uh, Dr. Engin Sustam actually asks, and I'll, I will give this privilege of the first question to him. Okay. He, he asks, uh, capitalism has often been presented as the only economic regime uh, conducive to the development of democracy. We are in an economic crisis of a capitalism and that uh, it's democracy. 
So could we create a utopian uh, society in this global crisis for a new democracy to come? How to read democracy and ideology in this political crisis of authoritarian liberalism and in this completely precarious and racist uh, uh, time? Uh, so I think this is uh, this is the question. Uh, okay, I will try to be to give a chance to others relatively short. Uh, up till twenty years ago, let's say there was some proof in this claim that capitalism is the only way to secure democracy. Because in capitalism, you had dictatorship for usually five, ten years, like in Chile, in Argentina, Brazil. But then, when things get better, you get democracy. What I am afraid, that's my analysis, is that today the capitalism, which is success, successful, is the successful version of capitalism is more and more authoritarian capitalism. That this uh, eternal marriage between capitalism and democracy is disintegrating. Take China. I have nothing against China, although people exaggerate a little bit their success in fighting the pandemic. You know what I always tell to those who praise China? I tell them, oh, oh, look at Taiwan. They did it even better than China. Yeah. You know? And uh, of uh, socialist countries, ex-socialist, I admire more Vietnam, which with very modest means did a good job. But what I want to say is that I remember when I was young, we, we hated two forms of capitalism most. The brutal wild competition which ruins families, proper brutal competition and authoritarian power. But didn't China succeed precisely in combining <laughs> these two features? No? You have brutal competition, you have very authoritarian uh, power. This is why we have this big problem. Is China a capitalist country or not? And it's not only China. It's also yeah. Erdogan in Russia, the other guy who is really dangerous, Modi, Narendra Modi in India and so on. Uh, even uh, uh, Putin tries the same thing, although economically not so successfully. But this idea of brutal capitalism combined with, at least up to a point, authoritarian, uh, authoritarian uh, nationalism. No, this is a new phase. And here, uh, I think liberal democracy at the worldwide level is gradually losing. And my hope is what here? Now, you will laugh. I'm not a utopian. I never meant that, oh, the pandemic will bring communism or whatever. But the pandemic and other crises that are coming, I think, will force us to do things in the leftist sense, which up till two years ago were unimaginable. Look, States already had to centralize health care. Everybody knows that the pandemic can be beaten only if, it, if we all mobilize uh, universally. In United States, in England, some other countries, even Trump effectively had to do, do something that almost looks like universal basic income and so on and so on. So this is my sad uh, prognosis. Pandemic is not the one, and then in a year with more vaccines, uh, well, life will return back to normal. Life will not return back to normal. Uh, 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 after this pandemic, if it will be over, but it looks, I don't know if it will be over. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we will get global warming, droughts, other problems, and so on and so on. And for me, it's some kind of a primary evidence that, <coughs> sorry, that things are already changing. When people say, but capitalism will remain, I tell them, wait a minute, capitalism is already changing. Are we aware how, for example, in the United States, how tremendously capitalism changed? How the wealth is, uh, the wealth is, uh, 
centralized more and more and all that and so on. And I think that uh, that as a reaction to this, the more there will be crisis, some kind of, it will not be, of course, the old Soviet style communism. That one is inefficient here. But some basic things like, for example, global health care, uh, some level of socialization of production. Like I like to use, although it's not good, this very risky war metaphor. You know, when you have a war, let's say you need 1,000 tanks and you don't ask where we will get the money, will the companies do it, how? No, you order it, you take over. We have to do this. Then social mobilization, local communities helping each other and so on and so on. So I think that uh, there are good things in liberalism. I mean, they are nice things. I'm not saying this, personal freedoms and so on and so on. But looking at the tendency of capitalism towards more authoritarian forms, I am claiming that the only chance to save what is worth saving in liberalism is to move it to the left a little bit. No, to at least some element, not, again, not Communist Party decides or whatever, but socialization of production, welfare reforms, or, or, uh, or uh, energy coordination, and so on and so on, uh, 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 global warming, how we will take care of that. For example, what is clear that is happening is that there are now new parts of the world which are so dry or hot where you cannot live. So there will be, everybody knows this, and people already worry about this, in next decades, there will be tremendous movements of millions of people, not just refugees, but I don't know. For example, the center of Africa is getting dry. Even I read somewhere that you are lucky not you, you are in safe Canada, <laughs> in northern Syria. But uh, I read that, for example, temperature are now uh, around there, South Iraq, Kuwait, Emirates, they are 50 to 55 degrees every summer. It's getting difficult even for people who were born there to live there. Only some kind of global organization connection can save us. So this is why, paradoxically, I'm an optimist because I'm a pessimist. I'm a pessimist because I think that we are approaching a permanent emergency state. We should get rid of this dream which was alive in Biden inauguration. It's over. It's over. Life will return to normal. No, life will not return to the old normality. No. And here I see uh, hope for us. Thank you very much, Professor Zizek. There are so many questions and I- Make um, a selection, I'm, play the master. You see, we need, that's what, what I was talking about. We need a leader, <laughs> you, you have to say. <laughs> we, Sorry, actually, there is a, the question is about the leadership and we have so many questions about that and I'm gonna Please. read one of them. Uh, uh, those questions but read are them the about, most aggressive one. Yes, th these questions are about the imprisoned Kurdish leader Abdullah Ocalan and his role in the Kurdish movement. Mm. So one of uh, Jihad Hani asks, imprisoned o uh, Abdullah Ocalan started to read all Hegel's major, uh, major books and he emphasized throughout his latest books, all written in prison uh, to return to uh, Hegel. He became kind of a Hegelian uh, more than uh, uh, following other uh, uh, intellectuals, philosophers. What is interesting is that Ojalan thinks that Hegel's philosophy is in agreement with relativity and quantum theory and indicates that Hegel can help us to understand relativity and quantum the theory and vice versa. And it's kind of in relationship with these social yeah. uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. And you also pointed out something similar to, throughout some of your books, especially in Less Than Nothing, that Hegel anticipated the quantum physics. Uh, can you elaborate on this? But I will uh, wait uh, to just say uh, to uh, ask you a couple uh, uh, more questions related to that. 
uh, Rosa Borch in the Q&A box uh, asks, uh, you have mentioned the role of leaders, especially in providing hope. Uh, yeah. How do you understand the role of Abdullah Ojanan in building a rela in, uh, an alternative order in Rojava? Thank you. And there are other questions about the yeah, role yeah. of Ojanan uh, mm -hmm. in building this alternative society, alternative revolutionary future both in Rojava and also in other parts of Kurdistan, Bakur, Northern Kurdistan, Turkey, mm. uh, Bashur, uh, Southern Kurdistan or Iraq, and Rojava mm. or uh, uh, East, East Kurdistan in Iran. Uh, no, again, yeah. precisely. We, we also, don't have so much time. To, for no, so I will try to be very short. Sure. Okay. But I cannot restrain myself from telling you a wonderful anecdote that happened to me when I visited Istanbul, but Orjalan was already in prison a couple of years ago, when, you know, some stupid journalist made with me an interview and asked me these stupid popular questions, like, what is the best scene you can imagine? What would you like to do? And to be obscene, okay, I answered, uh, and they published it in a big newspaper, I answered it, to be naked in bed with a beautiful young woman and debate with her Hegel and philosophy. <laughs> and then two days later, they showed me. A newspaper uh, published a letter from Ocalan, who said, I agree with Professor Zizek. <laughs> what I like to be. I found this so non-orthodox, you know, so wonderful to say, but I know, but uh, I know this. I just wonder, did the prison, which gave him, unfortunately, a lot of time to probably more time to read and so on, you know, but uh, uh, made for this turn towards uh, theory. I know already 10 years ago that he began to read Michel Foucault, Deleuze, and so on and so on. But it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful element. And the, the only point, but I cannot teach you here, I don't know the situation from close, is uh, in the situation that he is now. No? He... I wonder how many informations Ocalan has, has the access to, you know. That, uh, like, uh, but maybe he can turn this with intelligent politics into his strength. He no, can unfortunately, also... he hasn't been able to uh, see uh, his lawyers for a very long time. I, it's been years that uh, he- has... I know, but you know, sometimes this works. Remember Mandela that your very isolation for the people makes you a symbol which can exert a, maybe, I don't know, don't know anything personally about Orjalan at all, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe in a slightly cynical sense, this isolation of him can make him even stronger in the sense that if he were to be outside prison, he probably would have to get involved into some party struggles, blah, blah, up and down. He is needed now precisely as such a uh, as such, uh, symbol. But you see, that's what I meant. I uh, disagree with those anarchist leftists who claim that uh, leaders are bourgeois totalita uh, or totalitarian or whatever. No. There are authentic leaders. You need an inspiration whose message to you is not, I know better than you, you should follow me, but whose message it is, you can do. You can do more than you think you can do. I trust you, you will do it. And uh, just, uh, but we don't have time, I agree. You know what would have interested me? But Ocalan is, link to Turkish Kurds and to you. He, you are part of the same group. What's the relations between your, I will call it sorry for the, sorry for the obscenity, Turkish Syrian Kurds and Northern Iraqi Kurds? It is true, is it true that they are a little bit more, because they put it capitalist and so on or what? Or, yeah, well, is there any collaboration between the two of you? 
I, I, I am not in the position to talk about uh, this because I'm not there, but I know that, uh, that uh, there are relationships, but uh, unfortunately the politics, uh, the Kurdish politics is very much divided. And uh, what Rojava is standing for is uh, very much in line with the uh, with Ojalan's paradigm of democratic confederalism which is building uh, grassroots democracies uh, from uh, the bottom of society, ecological coexistence, coexistence of all ethnic and religious minorities, you know, gender liberation and this communal building, communal life based on cooperative. Uh, but, but you see another but not reason. In, not in Bashur. In Bashur is different. In Bashur, uh, very much it's... Uh, it's a, as you said, it's a very capitalist state. Yeah. No, but what I want to say is that that's why I admire you because people, you, this, let's call it Syrian Turkish Kurds, I know you are safely up there in Toronto or where, but Toronto. you also in Toronto, you have a hard lockdown. No, <laughs> there. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, let's go back to a serious question. So uh, what I want to say is that, is that, uh, uh, you know what is so paradoxical? And when I said these people misunderstood me that, not that I celebrated the old Turkish empire, but measured by today's standards, Tur Turkish empire was much more decentralized and so on, you know. All the big Turkish crimes like genocide, Armenian genocide and so on, they were part of the, the young Turks, the modernization of Turkey, the change of Turkey into, uh, into a modern nation state, you know. So uh, here Erdogan is totally lying when he calls for the return to the big Turkey and so on. No, he is the greatest uh, traitor of that. The big Turkey was with, uh, with uh, uh, for example, religiously, it was much more tolerant. I remember in the mid 19th century, it's a wonderful story. There was a small monastery group of neither Protestants nor Catholics, totally crazy Christians. Nobody in Europe wanted them. The Turks gave them in Bosnia a place where they live even today, you know. So maybe, ironic as it sounds, these countries like the old Turkey, not the old, which was more violent, 16th century, but 18th, 19th century, or Austrian-Hungarian empire. They were a model of this decent decentralized large countries, which maybe we can refer to today. I think that the tragedy of Turkey, again, is that, that it wants to be a modern nation state. You know, and then you and the others are, are, are paying the price, you know. So yes, yeah. all solidarity and what he said about quantum physics and so on. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it's even strange that people are surprised by it. People automatically think that if we are a radical leftist, we are some kind of idiots, you know what I mean? That so, just, so I we have a, no. a follow-up question. I think you would like that, uh, uh, Professor Zizek, that somebody asked, could we say Rojava and Ojalan are the real in the Lacanian signification? That is, uh, for the system cannot accept them. Don't, yes, yes, in this sense, but don't, uh, don't poeticize too much the real, you know. Real simply means something that is so traumatic that it cannot be integrated into our symbolic universe of meaning. Like, you know, concentration camps were also very real, you know. But yes, I think, but you know, that's why the Turkish official establishment, Erdogan and so on, don't want, don't want the peace with Ocalan, no? Because I know that Ocalan at a certain point was more for negotiations and so on, all these feminist motives and so on. And you know that the same thing is going in Kashmir. My friend Udi Aloni did a wonderful documentary of how the Muslim resistance in Kashmir decided no arms, we want peaceful reintegration. And India didn't tolerate this. They provoked them with violent attacks they claimed, no, this is just hypocrisy and so on and so on, you know. And it's incredible how efficient these lies are. 
like when I defend Oxalan and you and so on, they always, they have this image that is so deeply embedded in Western European and American popular culture, Kurdistan, wild, crazy place. But I told them, I learned this in Istanbul, but you Kurds are on average much less superstitious than Islamists. Somebody told me and took me to a Kurdish restaurant in Istanbul where he told me they don't tolerate any of these too many religious symbols or whatever. You, you are you are not some you are not like some crazy religious minority. You are on average more secularized part than what are the Kurds? Sorry for this question, you can lynch me for that. What are the Kurds, your type of Kurds, that is to say, Turkish, Rojava, Syrian Kurds? What are you mostly in religion? Uh, Professor Zizek, I, uh, uh, I, I don't think uh, uh, the, uh, in terms of politics, political parties yeah. are uh, very much uh, adhered to this Islamic uh, rules and regulations, yeah, they yeah. all respect Islam as uh, like kind of a cultural religion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is the, right now month of Ramadan. Uh, we had to wait until uh, iftar, but uh, this is uh, the reality that many people uh, uh, are Muslim in, in Kurdistan, in the region around, but uh, the issue has been coexistence of uh, Muslims with other uh, non-Muslims, with people who don't believe. I hope it works, it works. Yes, it, it, I, as I said, I'm not there, but I, it looks like that it is working because unfortunately yes. the, the, only, the only threat right now against Rojava is coming from Turkey because uh, people are right now are uh, trying to build this new uh, future and the University of Kobani is a symbol of that. University of Rojava is a symbol of that. They are, uh, they are determined to build uh, a new and alternative future for themselves, but unfortunately under a uh, constant attack. So this is the but, reality, like in terms of- uh, Yeah, yeah, that's very, yeah, yeah. No, it's very good are, that, that religion is not directly politicized in this sense. That's very good. No, it is not. And I will tell um, our friends in Europe, uh, there are many of them he, here in this room, mm. to uh, maybe if you, you could share your mail address with me to send you some uh, materials about the situation. Roger, My email Roger. address is extremely simple. S Zizek. The first letter of my name and my okay. family name, S Z I K E T Yahoo dot com. Yeah, yes, I will we'll send simple. you some materials. There are so many other questions. I know we are uh, quite over our time. Okay, but let's give another five minutes or whatever, no? Okay. Uh, do you I'll... have any any limit there that some policemen will come and say you are allowed? We don't to have stay. a limit. If you are available, we can we can continue. Okay, for some five minutes, let's go on then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So some of these questions are in Kurdish and uh, um, let me, uh, so one question there, we have received so many questions on mm. YouTube as well. Our colleagues on YouTube are collecting them. Mm. Unfortunately, I don't think we can ask them uh, all, but one of the question is also about how the, how stateless people, people uh, who are historically repressed like yeah. Kurds uh, can continue with their existence, what kind of political system, political future they can build in this uh, environment of hostility. So this is one question that is coming from uh, our attendees uh, about this uh, statelessness and uh, uh, especially about Kurds who are also uh, following it, uh, a leftist agenda, a leftist paradigm, mm -hmm. Ojalan's paradigm of uh, democratic confederalism. And it's not just about Kurds, it's about ethnicity, it's about building a different future, political future for the whole region. So if you have any comments on that. It, 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 this is, of course, a topic of which I know very little. I can just give two very common sense insights. The first one is that of course, in an ideal world, there should have been some kind of, at least, I don't know, confederacy between you, 
Turkish uh, Kurds uh, north of Iraq and, uh, and uh, uh, northwest of Iran. Maybe not a direct state, but I mean, you are, you are not dispersed into four states because of your stupidity, but because of their local geopolitical post-colonial gains and so on and so on. And I think that the, the, since this is difficult to imagine, now the other thing I think would have been to play, like the problem is how hard, how strong Erdogan is. There was some attempt, you remember, I don't know when, some five more years ago, an election in Turkey, where there was a small chance. You had some kind of Turkish Social Democratic Party, you had the Kurdish Party, then you had the left Kemalists, part of the Kemalist Party, and... Uh, the, the Kurdish one is a pro-Kurdish uh, uh, HTP, People's Democracy Party, who is right now under attack and they want to shut That's it down. the problem. The it's strategy like of Erdogan was, yes. It wasn't so much that he hated you Kurds, but he saw the possibility that if you Kurds join with whatever they are called, socialist, social democrats and progressive Kemalists, that then you may even win, no? That's why already then, I think the, the idea was that this Kurdish party is also terrorist and so on, or controlled by terrorists. But that's what I would try to do, not to play the game, we are alone against Turks, but trying to establish links with progressives in Turkey itself. That's the only chance, I think, no? Yeah, okay. It also depends, but I'm not, you know, I'm not there, you know, but I'm trying to be very realist. I don't like leftists who are dreaming too much. One has to be brutal, realist, what one can achieve. And what's now the situation in, uh, in Syria? Because for you, I know you're in Canada and so on, but for you in Syria, uh, now, isn't it that at a certain point, Assad even... He was definitely better than some of the rebels, then, my God, because you were, this was the lowest point of Erdogan. You were fighting ISIS, and Erdogan was bombing you, but <laughs> he also is fighting ISIS, all those scandals and so on, you know. That was exactly what was happening. So uh, yeah. uh, on yeah, one yeah, side, ISIS, and on the other Erdogan side, Erdogan denied it, but they, they caught Turkey smuggling some arms to the, maybe not ISIS, but to some fundamentalist rebels there, and so on, and so on, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah. yeah. But do you see any other option in this uh, situation? In Syria, maybe now that Islamist rebels are more or less defeated, you no longer have a threat from down there, or how? The main problem is now Erdogan. I mean, uh, the main, right now, uh, after uh, ISIS, the, uh, like ISIS is still existing, but the, actually I got this uh, comment from uh, someone in Rojava right now that uh, there are attacks, there are Turkish attacks in, uh, uh, on daily basis in the areas of Al Shahba, Ain Isa, and Tal Tamar. And as you know, the Turkish occupation army and with the jihadists uh, aligned with Turkey, they occupied Afrin. They occupy some parts of Jizre Canton. So uh, there are like real active uh, situation on the ground and uh, uh, people are trying to uh, defend uh, uh, Rojava. So right now the immediate uh, threat is uh, actually Turkey. But uh, 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 as you know, Assad's regime is not in that strong position to attack Rojava. And because of all of these geopolitical games and situations, they, they don't want to, uh, Rojava to be eliminated, except for Erdogan, of course. It, he, he would like to uh, see that disappear in one night. So the situation is uh, un ongoing, but what is important that the people uh, are really uh, very much building their life there and, uh, and based on the, in their communes, in their uh, cities, uh, and uh, 
the struggle continues, to be honest. There's one last question I, I could ask if you have Please? time, Professor Jack. Uh, Mansur asking, uh, uh, is communism, uh, could communism have multiple forms? Is it a name of particular, uh, a, a particular emancipatory fight in a local reality? Because no. there are communists that say Rojava or Ojalan, they are, uh, uh, that they claim that uh, Ojalan and Rojava are not communists because of their uh, locality. So kind of reducing the Kurdish movement, what Rojava is standing for to the ethnic identity of the Kurds and not as the universality of what they are saying, the universality of the democratic confederalism and uh, uh, the uh, political paradigm that Rojava stands for. I think that, first to this last question, I think, and I think if I got you correctly that you would agree from what I know, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that paradoxically to occupy this nationalist identitarian politics, just we as an ethnic group, would be in the long term catastrophic for you, even at the level of your national identity, you know, that even at this level, your chance is only this kind of a more federal view alliance with others and so on and so on. And uh, what about these differences and so on? My God, of course, first thing to do is to forget the 20th century communism. I mostly, maybe we should even abandon the name. I use the name only because I don't like socialism. No, no, I like it, but you know, socialism is such a neutral, empty name today. Every socialism means I can be a billionaire once. Bill Gates said that he's a socialist. Elon Musk said, you know, that I, I am a billionaire, but I care for the people and want to help people, which means not this. So by socialism, I mean this uh, communism, sorry. I mean this most elementary thing that key, we, we should use market moderately where it works. I'm not saying nationalize everything, but that with big existential questions, which will be now water, supply of water, energy, health, epidemics, global warming, and so on, there should be not only within the states, but internationally coordinated activity. And you call it whatever you want. But in this sense, of course, it takes a specific forum in every country. I even don't think that, that, uh, that, uh, that there will be, even organizationally, that there, it will be the same forum. At some point, maybe you need a little bit more centralization because you know, now as a provocation to you, I will tell you something. You know that, and many people, I'm giving it to you now as a provocation, many people, would uh, hated me for it and are, but te they tell me privately, I agree with you, but publicly they, they don't want to admit this, that uh, I think the goal should not be desalination in the sense of let's get, no, if by alienation you mean there is a well-functioning social apparatus of health or blah, blah, and I even don't know how it works, just it works then I don't have any problem with a good, I call it ironically to annoy people, a good alienation, you know. I don't want to live in a small village where every afternoon I have to go to a meeting, how will we distribute water, how will we distribute electricity. I like things to function, you know. In the, and I think that even the majority of the people, I will say now something horrible. <coughs> Yes, you have moments of political engagement and so on. They're wonderful. But in the long term, people want to live in peace, work, live a decent, safe life. And it's our task to offer them this somehow. Now, of course, in Rojava and elsewhere, this is cynical when you have Erdogan up there. But nonetheless, what is extremely important is that 
what you told me and what I heard from others, how you are already trying to organize efficiently things at the local level. This is also what good leftists are doing all around. For example, again, Bolivia. No, they, they, they didn't just make a big revolution. They organized this, you know, everyday things. Like uh, they organized free libraries which visited small villages and so on, all that stuff to make everyday life better. We shouldn't be ashamed of doing this. So it's very important, not, but in, in, uh, of course, it's very important also Erdogan and so on. And there, I think you Kurds have all the moral right to make pacts with the devil. Let Americans come, let whoever, Russians just protect us, you know. Here, you have to be very brutal pragmatics. None of this heroic logic, you know. But at the same time, that's what I admire in you again. The space where you gained a little bit of autonomy, these areas, that you there offer hope to people. You know, like you see, we are still threatened and so on, but everyday life, uh, everyday life goes on. This is why, again, I agree with Chomsky. However, I like Americans just to leave with their army parts of the world, in your case, they did an extremely disgusting thing, I think. They, their basic message was, let's leave it to Erdogan and Putin, you know, to, yeah, that's true. to control that's true. the area. And you Thank were, you very uh, much, Professor Zizek. There is I'm a, grateful to you. Somebody and on YouTube asking, how could European citizens, especially those coming from this leftist uh, backgrounds, yeah, yeah. how they can support the Kurdish movement and how, what, could, what should be the Kurdish movement's accept expectations? The Rojava uh, peoples, uh, Northeastern Syria, uh, Syrian people, like all Kurds, Arab, not just Kurds, I, of course. Yeah, yeah. As Syrians, uh, yeah, yeah. Christians, uh, is Yazidis, uh, how should, what should be their expectations from uh, leftists, uh, from the people in Europe, citizens of uh, Europe, no, uh, I try very, he very heavily not to treat you in a refined leftist racist way, you know, mm -hmm. projecting into you my, this is the most disgusting left. Either I pretend to know better than you or give you and give you lessons or even more disgusting, I expect from you the big universal answer. Not that, but again, my absolute sympathy and identification with you is because precisely because of all these paradoxes, you are so much caught into these geopolitical games around you that you, with your very objective situation there, you somehow uh, set the standard in the sense that, you know, every politician around there or state entity should be asked the question, how are you dealing with Kurds? Tell me this and I will tell you if I appreciate you or not. You, in a way, embody the ethical standard, not that you are extra good, but that if you mean seriously the simple values of us, uh, respecting people's dignity and so on, you should show it precisely with the case of you, but, but hopeless, you know, uh, like maybe you will survive. Listen, my country, we, Slovenia, we are, sorry for the vulgar expression, in the, in the same sheet up to a point as you. Look, we miraculously survived in the North Austria. They tried to swallow us in the West Italy, uh, in the East, other Slavs, you know like from, for Serbs and Croats, we were a minor, eccentric minority and somehow miraculously we survived. So history is not predetermined with good, good. Now I will use, propose you a paradoxical formula with good principled manipulation. <laughs> In the sense that you stick to your principles, but very realistically, you see who can help you, who cannot help you, and so on and so on. I think maybe you have a chance, you know. What you should, 
convinced countries around you don't they see it is that a thriving Kurdish community there would be an enrichment, a good point for all the countries there, because you should be that successful buffer zone which would then prevent big, big conflicts and so on and so on, you know. But don't think that you are automatically lost. Look to the south of you, Assad, Syria, strong country, but they, at least still now, they suffered almost more than you and so on. Iraq, they suffered uh, more than you and so on. No, it's a very tragic situation. But again, you know why I'm so fascinated by you? Because you are not what in European racism, as I said, many people expect that you would be some stupid, uh, 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 superstitious, primitive people. And, you know, Western liberals always like to support these primitive people with their rituals. Or, no, no, no. Like, I see you here, my God, and I met others. Like, you are more like us than many other people who think that they are more civilized around you. You know? So you. have a little bit of confidence. And I just hope that at some point when the pandemic, well, maybe now I'm utopian, when the pandemic will be over and all that, I would really like to visit you somehow, you know. But now the last formula was I fly to Istanbul, then I fly to southeastern Turkey and from them five hours by a car. That's not available right now, unfortunately. I even that oh, is not available. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because I'm old, tired, so if there will, will you have, because in northern Iraq, they had even an international airport, no? Yes, yes, yes. They do have the two international airports and uh, there were like actually so many questions if uh, Professor Zizek wants to come to Rojava. And I think... Uh, I already uh, made, it was almost an arrangement, but then... Uh, uh, the tensions happen. exploded there. Yes. No? Yeah. But if yeah. I will be well and alive, I would I would love to come there. Perfect. You know? Perfect. Next lecture in uh, at the University of Kobani in your presence. Thank you Absolutely. so, so much. No, Thank I'm so grateful to you. And I was a little bit ill. I had, you know, bombarded with problems. I have a diabetic crisis. I had, how to call this in my knee, menictus or what? Difficulty uh -huh. to walk. Everything is wrong, you know. But I, hope I will survive good. and, my God, keep, well, sir, keep sir, going sir. on. Please. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. now Thank I'm you. brutally leaving you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. And Thank uh, you. So thank much. you uh, to... Uh, uh, Mr. Jalil Kaya for interpreting uh, today's lecture. Thank you all for uh, being with us. And uh, again, apologies for the, again, technical difficulties of connecting our Zoom meeting to YouTube. I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, please don't forget to follow University of Kobani, University of Rojava, and their uh, online uh, social platforms. And uh, you can always email us at uh, at the Institute of Social Sciences at SSNInstitute at rojavauni.com. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of day.